<clears throat> we'll be on 153 tonight, and there was 154, 155, 156, and 157. That's the one tonight, 153. If you do not have your study guide sheets, we have extras up here. We will be on story number 153. 153 is right here. And then 154, 155, 156, and 157. So whatever you need, you can get it either now or get it uh, after class is over. Uh, there we go. We do want to say welcome to everybody. We're glad you're here. Uh, we're glad you're here in the auditorium. We're glad that you're watching online uh, via Facebook or via YouTube. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you all. Appreciate you so much. Now, I do want to once again remind you tomorrow kicks off on Fundamentals of the Faith at 7 a.m. Watch it at 7. Watch it later on anytime you want to. It is an easy way for you to help your non-Christian friends and family members to come to understand what the New Testament church is all about. For about a month, we're going to look at the New Testament church. We're going to look at the pattern of the New Testament church. So please tune in starting tomorrow on Fundamentals of the Faith. Also, uh, those who are watching, if you want a copy of these study guides, I will send them to you. Just email me at that email address right there that you see on your screen, and I'll be glad to, uh, uh, to do that. Scott is going to pass out some outlines. If you need an outline, just raise your hand. We're on 153 tonight. Now, we are in the upper room. Uh, the upper room, the traditional position of the upper room is right here. That is not really substantiated by evidence. Uh, that's a best guess, but that is not substantiated by evidence. Uh, the upper room actually could be anywhere in the city, but uh, by tradition, it's right here, close, not too far away from the uh, palace of the high priest. Personally, I don't think so, okay? I don't think the upper room would be that close to the palace of the upper priest. We have, we have all the way from 150 all the way through 157. And you've got 153, 154, and 155. And we'll be doing 153 tonight. 156 and 157 is down here. Okay? It's down here. So if you need 156 or 157, it's down here. Okay? Now, um, what will happen, what will happen is... Wherever the upper room is, they're going to travel to the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's where Jesus will be betrayed. Then he'll be led to the palace of the high priest. He'll end up uh, being on trial in front of Pilate, over on trial in front of Herod Antipas, and then back to Pilate, and then he'll end up at Golgotha on a cross, and he'll die there for our sins. We are on story number 153. We're going to be on this story number 153 for a couple of classes because this is a long story here. This is a long lesson that we're looking at. Let's talk about the Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was instituted during a Passover meal. Uh, Matthew writes about it, Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Mark writes about it. Luke writes about it. You might remember we did a whole sermon on the Lord's Supper about two months or so ago. So I'm not going to spend any additional time on the Lord's Supper. Uh, you have uh, already heard that lesson, so I'm going to uh, continue. If this is happening during a traditional Passover meal, which we think this is a traditional Passover meal, then we're talking about it's probably between 8 to 10 p.m., on our Thursday night, but their, what they would call, their, it would be their Friday. Their, their Friday started at sunset. Now, let's look at Judas' betrayal and Peter's denial. 
John chapter 13. Actually, I want to back it up to verse 18. John 13, verse 18. Jesus has washed the feet of his disciples. Remember, he washed Judas's feet. Think about that. He has Judas seated at the what honored position at the Passover meal. Verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. He's talking to the twelve. I know whom I have chosen. I know whom I have chosen. Jesus would not have chosen a scoundrel. He would not have chosen, you know, someone that uh, was just uh, evil, evil, evil. Judas at the beginning had potential. Judas had potential. As we talked already, Judas allowed Satan into his heart. Remember the heart? Remember that, that great famous painting of Jesus knocking on the door? And that door does not have an outside door handle? You have to open the door, either to Satan or to God. And Judas had allowed Satan into his heart. I know whom I have chosen. Go back, go back to the first time that Jesus mentioned this. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 70. We've got a large number of disciples who have left. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. We have a large number of followers who have left. Jesus turns to his 12. Are you going to leave also? You know, Peter makes that great uh, stand for Jesus here. But notice what Jesus says in verse 70. Did I not choose you, the 12? Did I not pick you out? You're the cream of the crop. And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Go back to John 13. But I've chosen, but the scripture might be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me. Eating bread with someone was a great sign of fellowship. It's a great sign of being together, accepting one another, being accepted. He said, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Lifting up the heel in their culture was a put down. It's a put down. And Jesus says, the one, you, he who's going to betray me, he's going to eat bread with me. I have extended my friendship to him, but he in turn has lifted his heel against me. In the seating arrangement as we have for the Passover meal, think about the feet of Judas. Think about where the feet of Judas are pointing to. They're pointing to Jesus, lifted up his heel against me. Jesus was not surprised by what Judas did. Jesus is in control. Now I tell you, before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he, that I am he. Another one of the great I am statements. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whoever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. In John 14, verse 1, Jesus is going to tell his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Why is Jesus troubled? Because this is going to be hard. Have you ever had a friend to stab you in the back? Have you ever had someone that you looked at as being a friend and they just stab you in the back? Judas had traveled with Jesus for approximately three years. 
They were friends, or they should have been. But Judas is not a friend. Jesus is troubled. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now keep in mind, the, the other 11, they don't really understand. Betray Jesus? Uh, what do you mean? You know, They're not putting betrayal, they're not connecting it to death. They don't really understand. They're still kind of uh, in the clouds. They don't understand. One of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about, about whom he spoke. Well, how could one of us hurt you, Jesus? How could one of us turn our backs on you? Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Remember the seating arrangement, John being the youngest, Remember, the youngest is the one who asked at the Passover meal, what is this not about? John is at his right side. Judas is at his left side. There was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Did you know this is the first time, the first time in the book of John we have that phrase? The disciple whom Jesus loved. John is writing. Why does he describe himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved? John is probably, I can't prove this, but John is probably the last of the apostles. We think that all the other apostles are, are dead by the time that John is writing the book of John. And remember in his epistle, 1 John, Think about how many times the word love pops up in that writing. I just wonder if the other disciples, see the other Christians, if they referred to John as, that's the one that Jesus loved. He's always talking about love. In fact, uh, according to legend, this is a legend, that when John was so, so weak, he couldn't get up, they would bring him by cot into a worship assembly and he would lean up from the cot and he would just say, little children love each other. Now, I'm going to get to that phrase, little children, in just a moment. That's an important phrase. But Jesus and John had a special connection. We got John leaning on his bosom. He's leaning on the body of Jesus. Simon Peter, who's somewhere you know, around the U-shaped table, Therefore, motion to him to ask, Hey, John, John, who is it? Who, who's he talking about? Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Who, who are you talking about? Who, who's going to betray you? I don't know if the others could hear this conversation. You know, Judas and Jesus and John are there together, the three. I, I don't know if the others could hear. Maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. Go over to Psalm. Oh boy, another prophecy fulfilled. Psalm chapter 41, verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted, that expression, has lifted up his heel against me. This is David talking about his counselor who sided with Absalom and went with Absalom over David. Now, he was David's counselor. He was David's trusted friend, but he ended up siding with Absalom. And this is who David is talking about here. But we also see it as a prophecy about what happens with Judas and Jesus. Jesus said, It's he who I shall give a piece of bread when I dipped it. There was common dipping bowls all scattered on the table. Uh, the dip was a, a fruit, a mashed fruit with spices. And what they would do is they would dip bread in it, like we might dip uh, our, uh, our cornbread into uh, gravy, you know. 
and they would dip that bread into that sauce and, and eat the bread. Made the bread a little bit more tasty. To give someone a morsel of bread is another sign of friendship. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. He's already allowed Satan in, and now Satan has got a big, he's got a big foothold through the door. He's in the heart of Judas. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Giving Judas the morsel of bread was the last chance. He reached out in love through the seating arrangement. He reached out in love through the washing of his feet. Here is a last chance. I'm going to give you this piece of bread. No change with Judas. Well, go. what you got to do, go do it quickly. Go do it quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast. Remember, after the feast of the Passover, we got the feast of unleavened bread. Or that he should give something to the poor. On the night of the Passover feast, that was the only night in the year that they kept the gates to the temple unlocked 24-7. Because by tradition, people during the Passover feast would give extra alms, extra contribution, uh, kind of like we might give like a, a end of the year extra contribution, okay? Uh, they would give an extra contribution to help poor people. So the other disciples thought, well, he's probably going out there to buy some things for the feast, or, or maybe he's going to give our alms at the temple. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately. Do not miss this. And it was night. Throughout the book of John, we've got a contrast of light and darkness. What does light always represent? Jesus, good, righteousness. Jesus is the light. What does darkness represent? Evil. John is painting us a picture, a word picture. Judas is evil. You can't trust him. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now, this is, amazes me, how Jesus could stay on track here. At this point, I'd be losing it. You know, at this point, you know, having my friend stab me in the back, knowing what's coming, I would have lost it. Jesus stays on track. He says, now the Son of Man is glorified. I've already been glorified. And God is glorified in him. God is glorified in me. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children. This becomes a catchphrase for John. When he writes his epistles, what does he say? Little children, little children love. Little children do this. Little children do that. He uses a term that Jesus himself had used. I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. But as I've said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. You can't come with me. So now I say to you, a new commandment. I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you're watching an old Western movie 
and you see some guys in the white hats, and you see some guys in the black hats, who's the good guy? The white hats. Okay, that's the way they used to do movies, you know. The white hats was the good guys, the black hats were the, the bad guys, the mean guys, the guys you can't trust. Jesus said, in the same way that you can tell who the good guy is in a movie, you can tell who is the Christian by love, by love. Remember how Jesus summarized the entire Old Testament? You know, 39 books. Jesus packs it down to two, two little things. He says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know what? That's a great way to summarize the Old Testament. Way to go, Jesus. You did a great job there. A two-statement summary of 39 books. Love. Now, Peter's going to come in here. Peter's going to come in here and um, talk here. For my, oh, by the way, if you do have a question, we'll do it in the last five minutes. And, oh, we've already got a question. So let's stop right here for a moment. I love questions. So let's stop here for a moment and look at the questions. I know that everyone has a choice, but like Pharaoh, was it prophetic that they did what they did? Was it unavoidable what they chose? Okay, let's answer that first question. Nobody's a robot. But just in the same way that you know your children, God knows us. If I was told, okay, Michael, you're going to have to go into a, uh, one of those glass figurine stores with those little breakable figurines, and this was back when I had little children, and you have to take one child with you, and anything you break, you're going to pay for it. I know which one of my two children I'm taking, okay? I know automatically I'm taking our son, okay? Our daughter could not resist picking up things and looking at it and, you know, tossing it in the air, whatever. You know, I would have paid a lot of money if I took my daughter. It's because I know my kids. God knows his children. And God was going to bring his children out of Egypt. Pharaoh would let, his, let God's children go. It was up to Pharaoh if he did it the easy way or the hard way. Because God's children were coming home to the promised land. Now Pharaoh decided to do it the hard way. So Pharaoh's people suffered. And even Pharaoh suffered with the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh's army suffered. You know, they got wiped out. But he could have let them go the easy way. God's children were going to come back to the promised land. But it really was up to Pharaoh, it was up to Pharaoh how he would do it, the easy way or the hard way. We've got two more questions. Oh, I love questions. Jesus must have known what Judas was going to do when he chose him. Uh, divine foreknowledge? Yeah, you know, in the same way I could say, okay, I know in that glass figurine store, I know that if I tell Justin, okay, Justin, I want you to sit here and not move. Justin would have sit there and not move. What would my Kayla, what would our daughter do the moment I turned my back on her? She would be up, you know, touching things and, you know, fiddling with things. So, yes, Jesus had divine foreknowledge, but let's not get lost here. Let's not think that Judas was a robot. Let's not think, well, Judas just had to do it. He had to choose. He made a decision Am I going to open the door to my heart to God, or am I going to open the door to my heart to Satan? He chose to open the door of his heart to Satan. And in so doing, he invited Satan in. And when you invite Satan in, if you give Satan an inch, what does he do? He takes a mile. That's what he did. He took a mile. Oh, we've got another question. Okay. 
What little children was Jesus referring to? The 11. He was looking at them from the viewpoint of God the Father. You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. He was looking at those 11 men the way God would look at them. John, who wrote, you know, John and 1 John, 3, 2 John, 3 John and Revelation, when he writes little children, he's writing as an old man looking at younger church members. You know, if, if Judas was an older teenager when he started following Jesus, now that's the theory, that maybe he was 18, 19, 20 when he started following Jesus, okay? So that would be in around 27 A.D. That would mean that John was born, say, around 7 or 8 A.D., and we think that John doesn't die. Now, this is a think so, not a definite. We, we think that John doesn't die until the middle 90s A.D. That means when John died, he was upper 80s. He was an old man for that time period. Uh, people didn't live that long normally. And John could look around and he could call those people little children. Um, I had a, a gentleman a few years ago uh, that I did his funeral for. He was 107, almost made it to 108. And he called me over and said, Michael, come over, I want to plan my funeral. So I went over there, and he kept on calling me the kid preacher. I was in my 50s, okay? <laughs> to him, I was the kid preacher, okay, because he was double my age. So little children, Jesus is calling his Disciples, those 11 men that are left, little children. Not in a put-down way, but in a loving way. As a father with children. Jesus felt a closeness to these men. Because think about it. His own family had rejected him. At the cross, we only see Mary. And then eventually Jesus' brothers do become believers. At least two become believers, maybe more. But at this moment right here, all Jesus has is those men, those 11 guys. Think about only having 11 people that you feel like you can depend on. And remember what they end up doing. They all... You know, they all run away except John. Peter follows at a distance. Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, verse 36. Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I want to follow you now. I will lay down my life for your sake. Oh, Peter, you've got foot in mouth disease. Because you're speaking before you're thinking here. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Now, when we get to those denials, when we get to those denials, get ready. We're going to try to make sense because it's really confusing. Oh, who was Peter talking to and which order it was and all that? I'm going to try to clear that up, but that comes with the denial. We're not ready for those denials yet. We are ready for the farewell speech. Jesus will make a farewell speech. It will start in John 14, and actually it goes through John 18. We have a prayer from Jesus at the end. What time is it? It's probably at least 9 p.m. Could be as late as 11 p.m. Let's split the difference and say it's 10 p.m. And Jesus is going to talk to them. Now, on your outline, on your study guide, instead of giving you supplements, I'm going to ask you to write. I'm going to give you a lot of information. So be prepared be prepared because you may not be able to write everything. If you're going to write everything I'm going to say, you're going to need two or three extra sheets, okay? Let's begin. In his farewell speech, his farewell discourse, 
Jesus will drive home the following points. Point number one, he is leaving. Point number two, the apostles will continue his mission with opposition from the world. And point number three, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will assist them. We begin in John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why would they be troubled? Well, Jesus has said, someone's going to betray me from this group. Jesus has not been his normal self. Have you noticed the number of times it says Jesus was troubled? Three times already. Jesus is not, you know, when I picture Jesus, I don't picture someone down in the mouth and, you know, you know, I picture someone that enjoyed life, enjoyed being with people, enjoyed children. I see him with a smile on his face and I see love. That's my picture of Jesus. But Jesus has not been acting right at this Passover meal. He even said some things during the meal, what we call the Lord's Supper, that they don't really understand. So they're troubled. They're talking about, they're talking between themselves. They're trying to figure out. So Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. That's a rhetorical question. You believe in God? Well, yes. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. There's plenty of room. Plenty of room. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Why am I leaving you? I'm leaving you so I can prepare a place for you. Remember, the upper room was prepared. Who had arranged that? I would say Jesus had made arrangements with the owner of that upper room. You have everything ready. Here's what I need. Here's what I want. Well, Jesus has gone to heaven, he says, to prepare a place for them, a mansion. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, hey, that means I'm going to come back. I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, this caused some confusion in the early church. The church in Thessalonica said, well, Jesus said he's coming back, so that must mean he's coming back just any day. You know, uh, he didn't come back this year. He's going to come back next year for sure. And they basically were, the church in Thessalonica was basically just sitting down saying, okay, Jesus, we're ready for you. We need to keep on serving. We, we need to keep on doing. We need to keep on bringing people to the Lord Thomas said to him, go over to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 16. This is their journey to Lazarus when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Thomas said, who's called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Hey, I want to go. I want to be with Jesus. And I say I'll go wherever, wherever you are. So Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? In other words, Thomas is saying, give me the GPS coordinates. I want to know where you're going so I can be on the trail. I can be right behind you. How can I know where you're going? How can I know how to go if I don't know where you're going? Jesus said to him, I am, this is the six of the seven great I am statements, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The answer is the right relationships. The right relationships. As I said, this I am statement is the sixth of the seven important I am statements in John. Now, how did the early, how, how did the early Christians 
come to be called? What, 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 what phrase, what term do they use to refer to the early Christians? Now, the Christians themselves called themselves Christians. But what did the other people call them? Look at Acts 9, verse 2. Acts 19, verse 9. Acts 19, verse 23. Acts 22, verse 4. Acts 24, verse 22. What did they call those people? The way. Where do they get that? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those early Christians talked about Jesus being the way. So other people started calling them that. Hey, those are those people of the way. That's how they referred to them. Well, they're those people of the way. Jesus here says he's the way, the only way to God. He's the truth, 100% truth. And He is the life, the life. The only way to have true life is through Jesus. Now, we're almost out of time. Coming up on Sunday, Lord willing, Philip is going to ask, show us the Father. Hey, I want to see, a, I wanna, can you give me a Kodak picture of Him, a, you know, a glossy 8 by 10 We're going to look at that. We're going to look at uh, also uh, uh, how the apostles would do even greater things. Because Jesus said, you're going to do even greater things than I did. How's that possible? And we're going to also talk about how did Jesus answer our prayers. We're going to talk about how prayers are answered. We're going to also talk about how prayers are not answered. Uh, we're going to uh, look at what we should ask for. At least three things. And then we're going to look at, if you love me. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The best barometer of our love for God is our love for God's children. That's all coming up. Uh, that's all coming up on uh, Sunday, Lord willing. Uh, you've been a great class. I appreciate you so much. We don't have any more questions. I do appreciate everyone who sent in a question. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. If you need any of these outlines, please grab them before you leave. And that's it. We're out of time. Appreciate it so very much.